The fear of chaos elevates peripheral security in places like Xinjiang and Tibet to major national policy priorities and makes Beijing neuralgic about problems such as Hong Kong. In the peripheral border areas, the party state sees threats everywhere, which has led to extraordinarily repressive measures. I used to travel to such areas frequently when I was ambassador and often since. And I'm returning to Beijing and retelling my travel tales to officials who seem to find my interest in these exotic places a little odd. I would warn them that their policies as pursued would only create the problem they were trying to avoid, namely instability on the periphery. Like much of my advice, of course, it had no influence. But we're seeing that played out again today. China executes its grand strategy through all means of statecraft, as one would expect a great power to do, militarily, economically, and through foreign interference and exercise of influence. Economic statecraft looms, looms large, however, because of, China's, because of China's economic capacity. It is an enormous market, and the rulers in Beijing know it and exploit this to China's advantage. Belt and Road has emerged since Xi's Astana speech in 2013 as the most significant organising principle for China's overseas engagement, both for foreign relations and for trade and investment. However, from the, uh, however far from imposing a Sinocentric order on the world, it has continued to overpromise and underdeliver. It has brought upon itself pushback where loan conditions or the behaviour of Chinese firms have been unreasonable or usurious. It has also been embraced as countries seek support for building much needed infrastructure. It is a changing and evolving, uh, but it is changing and evolving, but it's here to stay as the principal means by which China seeks to exercise influence as part of its grand strategy. As a great power, Beijing may wish for a world sub subservient to its interests, just as the US wishes to remake the world in its own image. If this is the intent, then the means or capacity for both great powers to do, it, do this is severely limited. Even during the US unipolar period, from the end of the Cold War until the global financial crisis, the world continued to be a messy place with little convergence of political and economic systems towards US-defined norms. China will have no more success in this if that is indeed its intention. Beijing's grand strategy seems mainly intended to make the world a more benign place for the Chinese Communist Party. In particular, to avoid overseas Chinese communities becoming sources of political opposition. Memories of Sun Yat-sen and the early nationalist movement in Japan at the end of the 19th century are part of the Communist Party's folklore. In the book, I assert that we already have a new order. It's not in the making, but it has emerged under our noses. It has been formed by the relentless economic ascendancy of China and the less predictable retreat by the US from global leadership. On reflection, this perhaps should not have been so surprising, um, uh, and nor is it a matter of Trump alone. Rather, it's probably a manifestation of decades of unrelenting, unwinnable wars conducted by the US. The New World Order is a multipolar order with two major dominant powers, US and China, but many other important actors, either because of their military power or strategic positions or both, and Russia and Turkey come to mind. Many actors in the New Order are authoritarian powers with whom Australia does not share values. Each major power, to various degrees, has gathered around itself its own bounded order. For the US, it is the remnant of the old liberal international order, including, of course, Australia. For China, it is Eurasia, so that from Beijing to Warsaw, China is the dominant power. We might congratulate ourselves, for example, for having barred Huawei from our 5G network. But Huawei today provides the digital backbone for Eurasia and indeed much of West Africa, uh, much of uh, West Asia and Africa. The concept 
of a bound order that I use is derived from Mesheimer's, Mesheimer's work on offensive realism. Each order will have a powerful state at its head and rules and institutions that reinforce stability within the order. In the case of China's bound order, it is the raft of arrangements it has been progressively putting in place over the past 20 years, such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the New Development Bank, uh, and the Belt and Road Initiative. Meshheimer's view is that a global order is inherently unstable and can, uh, in such circumstances, the order is inherently unstable and can only lead to war. To the contrary, however, US military supremacy and the threat of nuclear war suggests this is unlikely. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it, in most uh, cases, the chance will be that China and the US will avoid war. Also, there are many examples of ascendant states preserving and supporting the position of the dominant state because of the public goods the dominant state continues to provide are valued by the ascendant state. The US and UK in the late 19th century and for most of the first half of the 20th century is a good example of this. The bounded orders will cooperate in multilateral forums as the interests of the dominant powers uh, deem, but the likelihood of bilateral deals between dominant powers, such as what we've seen with the US-China uh, trade deal signed in last December, increases, and it increases usually at the cost of allies. Such is the world Australian foreign policy will have to navigate. I describe this in the book as Australia's dystopian future. It is a world in which no single dominant power prevails, especially one whose values we share. Gone is Pax Britannica, gone too now is Pax America, Australia is on its own. Of the lesser powers, some are like-minded with Australia, but many are not. Australia needs to work out how to work with such states both to hedge against China and advance our interests more generally. One encouraging development indicating that Australia may be at last starting to grasp a realist foreign policy is the ramping up of our relations with Vietnam, much of it in the press recently. Here again, we are following the US down this path, but it is encouraging to see that a country which is an authoritarian one-party state with no rule of law and a terrible human rights record is now being courted by Australia. I think there are some other states in the region that you could describe in such a way. Australia itself needs to think about its own grand strategy. But to do that, we need to form a view of China's actual capacity to harm Australia's interests, uh, not its purported intent. Much of the book deals with China as a constrained superpower, or as I call it, Prometheus bound. Despite the difficulties and challenges in dealing with China and its behaviour which uh, so uh, legitimately at times upsets us and other states, China is most unlikely to become a regional, let alone a global hegemon. It is already the dominant power in East Asia, but that is far from becoming a regional hegemon in the same way the US was in the Western Hemisphere under the Monroe Doctrine. And I'll just summarise the constraints, uh, but they're developed fully in the book. Firstly, China's constrained by geography. It has 14 countries on its border and 22,000 kilometres of land border to defend. It's constrained by its history. It's still an empire with unresolved territorial issues inside its border. Think Xinjiang, Tibet, Taiwan, and now as a result of Beijing's own making, Hong Kong. Uh, but most importantly of all, and a big chunk of the book deals with this, China is constrained by its natural resource endowments. For 3,000 years, China... Uh, well, China's a very rich country, and for 3,000 years, it was largely self-sufficient. And then there was a big population explosion from the 1950s, a lot of people, but they are really poor, so they still had a lot of resources. It was only from the second half of the 1990s that, uh, uh, that China was becoming richer and richer, and as it became richer, it found it needed to import more and more critical resources, crude oil, iron ore, you name it. And by the end of the 1990s, early 2000, China is emerging from being uh, uh, self-sufficient in these things to becoming a significant global importer. Ten years later, in most of these commodities, it's by far the world's biggest 
biggest importer. And all of these things, crude oil and uh, minerals, all go through the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea. Guess what? If you're sitting in Beijing, none of this was anticipated, completely unintended consequence of enormous economic success. But when you're sitting in Beijing, uh, you view this as a massive strategic vulnerability, which terrifies them because those vital sea lanes could be shut by the United States in a heartbeat. So from China's perspective, the South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca are often described as the boot on China's throat. And that actually what drove so much of the early work on the Belt and Road Initiative by China was to open up alternative transport routes. So just to conclude, oh sorry, and there's one, one other constraint on, on Prometheus that bounds China and limits its exercise of power. Uh, China is the great underperformer in soft power. Now this seems like an incredible contradiction given how magnificent Chinese traditional culture is, calligraphy or cuisine, uh, theatre, poetry, literature. But the problem for China today is to project soft power. Its soft power endeavours uh, have to go through uh, the Communist Party. They have to conform to the, to the narrative of the Chinese Communist Party. That may sell well in China, but it doesn't sell well overseas. And as I say in the book with a few numbers, but they're probably you know, uh, factoids, uh, as far as you can tell, there's been an enormous investment in CGTV. But I, I would suggest to you that of all the wasteful investments the Chinese state has made, or the Chinese government has made, the most wasteful would have to be CGTV. Because when you look at any polling over the last 10 years, China's standing in the world in terms of trustworthiness, likability, uh, you name it, has collapsed. So soft power and the inability to project soft power is structural, it's not going to go away, and so that further constrains China's capacity and ability to exercise power. Finally, just to turn to um, Australia and China, um, all of this is, is not to say um, that China is not going to use all instruments of its statecraft, hard, sharp and soft power, uh, against Australia to influence Australia. At the same time, Australia will need to harden its defences in each of these areas, and the Australian government has been doing this. In addition to girding our loins, uh, which is the prudent thing to do, Australia needs first to resolve, however, whether China is a strategic competitor or a strategic cooperative partner. If we continue to follow the US and the former, then the current situation we find ourselves in um, is likely to continue. Uh, for some time, indefinitely perhaps. As Angus Hewson, former chief of ADF, said recently, quoted in The Guardian, China is not our enemy. He's saying that because we have become to behave as if China were. And if you make China your enemy, it will become your enemy. Our, our, our standing on this, um, uh, and, and whether we decide whether China is friend or foe, will come at considerable uh, cost to our living standards if we are not able to find an alternative between a view of the world with China um, where we um, uh, are, are, um, are viewing China as, um, uh, as an enemy, as it were, or whether we uh, roll over and let uh, China tick at our tummies. I mean, this is how policy sits today, as a binary choice uh, between sycophancy and hostility. And the rest of my book really deals with an argument about how there are positions between these extremes which shape and frame our current policy debate between sycophancy and hostility. And quickly, the few things that I, I touch on is that we obviously need to hedge with regional neighbours and other like-minded uh, countries. And to do that and to hedge successfully, we need to build much stronger and better bilateral relations with our regional neighbours. A hedging strategy, however, uh, should be transparent and should be easily explained uh, to China, not seeking their endorsement, but to try and uh, reduce suspicion and uncertainty about our motivations. Uh, and in the end, I set out 10 points on which we could re 
uh, position, our bilateral relationship with China. Uh, just quickly, some of them, continued US presence in the region based on US interests in the region, uh, and that will continue. I'm asserting that as, as something that will happen. Um, we need to be clear about a preference for engagement and containment. I mentioned active middle power diplomacy. Um, we need, a, as I mentioned, a transparent policy of hedging. Um, and I think we need to start to work in the region to build some regional security mechanism. It's extraordinary that the most dangerous area in the world, East Asia, does not have any sort of formal regional security mechanism. And that would be, should be a major task for Australian governments to lead on. In short, what Australia needs is, um, is much more diplomacy um, and a properly resourced diplomatic effort. Australian policymakers should also be mindful, and this is my last point, that for, uh, for its own interests, the US could well be expected to recalibrate its relations with China over the next couple of years. It could do this and begin a conversation with China in which we are not involved, just as Nixon did all those years ago and for which Whitlam's audacity in searching for an authentic Australian foreign policy uh, helped uh, uh, prepare and position Australia for that eventuality. Thank you.